Uh, so that's also the reason I joined the burnout panel. <laughs> anyone was wondering. So kia ora. I'm Alex, as Jen said, I'm prototype Alex on the net. Before I begin this talk, I'd just like to point out that despite the name of the talk, this is not a technical talk. I'm going to be talking much more broadly than JavaScript, or even our industry. I'm going to be talking about New Zealand and our tech community and our culture, and how we, as tech professionals, can work together to make it better. But not just better for ourselves, but better for everyone. First off, let's just take a step back and look at this country of ours, New Zealand. We're a relatively small country. There's probably about 4.4 million people that live here. And at first glance, we appear to be doing OK. We've got some good points. We have the least corrupt government in the world, which is amazing. So good job there. We spend a lot of money on our public education system compared to the rest of the countries in the OECD. This is also great. And about 80% of all of the households in New Zealand have access to the internet. And then we have some bad points. Out of the 35 countries in the OECD, we score 12th for income inequality, which means that income is distributed unevenly amongst our population. This is not great. We also have the seventh worst incarceration rate. For every 100,000 Kiwi citizens, 202 are serving time in jail. Australia have a much lower rate, sitting at only 130 per 100,000, and Japan at 50 per 100,000 in prison. And what I consider to be the most disturbing statistic we have is our child poverty. In New Zealand, 295,000 children live in income poverty. That's one quarter of our entire population of children in the country are living in poverty. 90,000 of those live in severe poverty. These are kids living in material hardship, going without a good pair of shoes, not knowing when the next decent family meal is, often having no heating in the family home, and typically not having lunch for school. Personally, I think we're in a bit of a state. But what are we supposed to do? This is the tech industry, and all of that's politics, right? Tech is neutral to politics. This is an argument I've heard recently. We aren't neutral because we build technology that affects society. And we shouldn't be neutral because we are in a good position to do something about it. And sadly, I don't have a strategy or plan to solve these problems. However, luckily for us, we've already been handed a map that shows a way out of our current situation. Sir Paul Callaghan, a highly celebrated New Zealand physicist, gave a keynote presentation in 2011 explaining how we can solve the majority of our problems. That same year, he received the New Zealand of the Year Award, and then sadly, after a long battle with cancer, he passed away the following year. Despite this, through the thoughts and ideas he passed on during that keynote, his legacy lives on. The strategy he presented has been heralded by the academic community, and to a lesser extent the government, as a solution to our current economic situation and a way towards prosperity. The presentation, called Sustainable Economic Growth for New Zealand, an optimistic, myth-busting approach. Nailed it. I was having trouble saying that one. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly presented facts about our current economy. Why certain approaches to government spending, commonly believed by many, can't and won't work, and laid down a single strategy that could make New Zealand prosperous. Before I begin explaining Sir Paul's talk, there's just one point I'd like to cover. Why? Why make New Zealand prosperous? Why should that be our main goal? As a country, we need money. We need money to pay for things like our infrastructure, our roads and public transport systems. We need money to pay for Pharmac, 
so people can have access to the drugs they need to get better. And the Christchurch rebuild is up to an estimated $40 billion, so we need money to pay for that too. All these things don't come for free, and typically the government foot the bill, so we need to become prosperous. As a country, we need to make more money so the government can get more money through taxes so they can better support us. Right. Sir Paul's goal was to bust the myths that surround our economy. And here's a simplified graph that will help us explore his ideas. On the x-axis, we have the average annual income per capita. On the y-axis, we have the average hours worked per week per capita or per person. And the size of our bubble there represents our GDP per capita. I've put some other countries that are in our OECD in here so we can see how we're doing in relation to them. And GDP stands for Gross Domestic Product, which represents the total dollar value of all goods and services produced over a year. Our goal here is to find a strategy that increases our annual income per capita, so shifts us that way, and makes our circle bigger. Ideally, we'd want a circle about the size of Germany or the United States. And it would also be awesome if we could work less like Germany there. <laughs> uh, just a note, the graph that I'm using here and its underlying models I'll use to alter the economy were created by Dr. Dr. Graham Jensen and myself in 2011 in a joint project called 100 Companies. I've since updated it to reflect 2015 figures. You can go there if you want the references. So, first myth. We're good at dairy, so why not invest more in farming? This sounds like a good idea. If you look at the impact our dairy industry makes on our economy, it's massive. So why not make it even bigger? We have around 6 million cows in New Zealand, so let's add 20 million to that. Let's, let's have 26 million cows. We've only got 4.4 million people, but okay. In doing so, we'll be pushing more people out of other workforces to work on farms. And the net effect of doing that is this. So we've shot up to the top corner, which is the opposite of where we were trying to go. So what happened there? First off, our hours worked went up because farmers are very hard workers that work long hours. The average annual income per capita went down. This is due to the bulk of the farm support workforce earning a lower than average annual pay. And lastly, our GDP per capita didn't change much. Fonterra, our dairy, dairy cooperative, is a well-oiled machine. It's fair to say that unless we get exclusive trade deals into other countries, it's quite hard to get Fonterra performing better than they already are. However, Fonterra bring in 7% of our GDP which is massive, would be in a bad state without them. But the dairy industry isn't one we can double anytime soon. So scaling our agricultural industry is not a path towards prosperity. Myth number two, why don't we invest in tourism and get more people to visit New Zealand? About 2.5 million tourists visit New Zealand every year. So what would happen if we tripled that and get 7.5 million people here. There we go. We didn't shift as much as the, the dairy industry, but we've still gone backwards. So how did that work? The main problem with scaling our tourism is that our GDP per capita shrunk. And to figure out why, we have to look at how each job impacts our economy. Our per capita GDP is around $51,000 a year. The GDP is around $240 billion, and so evenly distributed over our people, 4.4 million people, it comes to $51,000, so that part's good. However, not everyone earns the money. There's only 1.9 million jobs. So, to maintain our current per capita GDP, we need to have each job on average bring in $125,000. Sorry. Yeah. Tourism earns about 
$800,000 revenue per employee. So the more people we push into working into the tourism industry, the lower our GDP will go. On top of that, it also has a lower than average annual income, which is why we saw that dip there in the graph. It leaves us with our third and final myth. Let's go mining. Mining is the future. Let's dig up all of our assets and sell them. <laughs> I don't need the graph. I don't need the graph to prove this one. Mining isn't sustainable. Pure and simple. It's a one-off boost to our economy. <laughs> but once we're out of resources, it's over. We need more money year on year, consistently, not just till the wells dry up. So with that, Sir Paul concisely pointed out that New Zealand is poor because we, as a country, choose to be We've been pulling on the wrong strings, investing in the wrong areas of our economy, and it's making us poorer. However, if you recall, to become prosperous, we need to create more jobs that increase our average annual income per year and our GDP. And you may have already guessed it, but the answer to how we become prosperous lies within our tech industry. Sir Paul stated that if we add another 100 top high-tech companies into our economy would significantly boost our GDP. A hundred companies, similar to the likes of Xero and Fisher & Paykel Healthcare. A hundred top high-tech companies, a hundred inspired entrepreneurs to add an additional $45 billion a year into our economy. So you may be asking, how does that work? Let's see what adding another 100 top high-tech companies to our economy does. Bang. That's exactly where we wanted to be. We've caught up with the UK. Size of our bubble's grown. It's awesome. So why did this happen? The reason our GDP per capita jumped so high was because tech companies punch way above that $125,000 employee mark we're after. So the more people we get working in the tech industry, the higher our GDP per capita grows. And you, as you all know, jobs in technology pay above the average annual income of $53,000. And that's why we saw the shift towards the right. But the most important thing to note is that the tech industry is one we can scale. We can have more tech companies and we can have bigger tech companies. We're only limited by the amount of talented people we have in our shores. And for that reason, Sir Paul proposed we make talent, oh, sorry, New Zealand a place where talent wants to live, to lure entrepreneurs, innovators, makers and creators into the country, have them build their high-tech companies here, and pay their taxes so we can all prosper together. That all sounds great. Let's do it. But how? How do we go about doing that? Again, I don't have a solution for how to implement Sir Paul's vision. But yet again, smart people have figured it out for us. The McGuinness Institute have steadily been working on creating a strategy to grow New Zealand's tech scene. This has been done through a research project called Talent NZ. In this project, they've laid down a path for New Zealand to be transformed into a place where talent wants to live. The strategy sets out four main areas on which we need to focus on for this transition to happen. Growth, we want to grow more talent here. Attraction, we want to attract talent from overseas. Retention, we need to get people to stay here in our industry. And networking, we need to get everyone talking together. It sounds like we're sorted, right? However, in my mind, Sir Paul and the the McGuinness Institute missed one important detail. Why? Why, out of all of the countries in the world, would you pick New Zealand? Why would an entrepreneur, developer, or engineer want to live here? What would be the compelling reason that would cause talented people to say, New Zealand is the place where I want to do my business? When Sir Paul explained why people like Sir Peter Jackson keep their companies in New Zealand, he alerted to our beautiful scenery 
as one of the main draw cards, saying, they're crazy, passionate, nutcase Kiwis who love it here. And this is where I think we have a problem. Our environment is not in a good condition by any means. The rivers and streams are in a state, and the government hasn't set the bar very high for their quality. I mean, sure, our views are breathtaking at times, but that's not unique to New Zealand. Almost all countries in the world have beautiful views. You just, know, you just have to know where to look. And when you're working hard, trying to get your startup off the ground, do you really take time to notice the sceneries? No. I don't think people will stay in New Zealand for a 100% pure environment. If I had to gamble, I'd bet people stay here for their friends, for their families, and for their communities. It's through communities we can achieve all the goals set out by the McGuinness Institute. It's through communities we can grow talent, attract talent, retain talent, and allow networks to grow. I believe that the fundamental piece that Sir Paul and the McGuinness Institute missed was the community aspect. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It's the people, it's the people, it's the people. And we can support the people through communities to give tech to everyone. I don't believe we can leave the task of making New Zealand the place where talent wants to live up to the government. They can't evolve to adapt to the fast pace of change that technology brings. And their priorities change between governments, so we'd need all parties to come to an agreement about pushing forward this goal. We can't leave the task of making New Zealand the place where talent wants to live to the companies either. Their priorities are different to that of the community. It's much easier for New Zealand companies to find talent by opening up offices internationally than it is to address the underlying talent shortage. But they're not to blame for this. It's just the way corporates generally operate. Financial return on investment comes before social return on investment. I believe communities can solve this problem. They can nurture and grow new talent. They can be built to support their people and they can be a place of belonging that people find comfort in. But best of all, they have the ability to be less biased than any corporate or government solution. So what I propose is, as a tech community, not to aim for making New Zealand a place where talent wants to live, but instead aim to make New Zealand a place where talent can thrive, so technology can truly be for everyone, the young and old, for technologists and non-technologists alike. Tech for everyone. And how we do this is by investing in our community. So if we go back to those four points, of growth, attraction, retention, and networking, we'll look at each one under a community lens, analyze what we're doing, where we want to be, and how we can get there. Let's start with growth. There's no denying we have a talent shortage in New Zealand. So it's fair to say something has gone wrong somewhere in the education system. If we look at the primary school system, they're in the middle of adopting new standards to allow digital technology to push forward into the current curricula, which is great, but it stops a bit short. And due to the combination of the fast rate of change of technology and the time it takes to build a new curriculum, I have serious doubts that the curriculum that they create will remain relevant going forward into the future. And then there's a problem that teachers don't have the skills they need to teach technology subjects. And when they do learn the ropes of computer science, there's nothing stopping them joining the IT industry to get a significant pay rise, better working hours, and probably bonuses they've never dreamed of, like healthcare plans, paid lunches, and shares, to name a few. The government try hard in this area, and they're changing their strategy from deciles to social investment but it's unknown how this will pan out. Though I do sympathize for them, because there's a lot of red tape, bureaucracy, and budgets that change depending on who's in power. Occasionally, you get great things like the Mind Lab, an innovative setup to help train teachers in digital and collaborative learning. And while it's awesome that they're there and have momentum behind them, it's important to remember that no one solution can solve all of our technical education problems. MindLab can't possibly solve all of them alone. 
to solve the problem of teaching kids and growing talent, all we're left with are the community-driven organisations. Organisations that change the system piece by piece. Organisations like Gather Workshops, who help push web technologies into schools, training teachers and working with students directly. Organisations like OMG Tech Rangers, Code Club Aotearoa, and the Coda Dojos, all places where kids can go to learn the wonders of technology. Alongside them, we have a number of local organisations dedicated to helping the people of their community. These groups are typically run by volunteers, funded by good people and companies. And they're a shining beacon of how the community can spread knowledge and grow talent. But that's just the kids. What about the adults? In the not too distant future, I'd imagine that large parts of our workforce are going to be replaced by machines. And as a result of this, countless adults will require retraining because their industry disappeared overnight. There's a handful of organisations already attempting to teach adults tech, but we need more. We can't just leave the growing of our talent to the current education system. We need to build more communities and organisations to support spreading technology to everyone. We need to put students and learning at the centre and build curricula fit for the future. To encourage people not to be consumers of technology, but instead to be makers, to be creators and to be hackers of technology. The attraction of talent to our shores is something that the government and corporates are doing very well at. There are multiple websites dedicated to showcasing New Zealand's high-tech scene and beautiful scenery to people overseas. Websites created in conjunction with various government departments, offering work in some of our most prestigious companies. However, if we set out to make a large public community, we can help attract talent too. We must continue to run tech conferences that put New Zealand on the international stage. Conferences like Webstock and the sadly discontinued KiwiCon, and even this newly minted NZJSCon. Conferences that invite guest speakers from around the world to show off New Zealand, our community, and our people. We need more of these. We need more local meetups to publish their content online so that everyone in the world can watch and learn. We need more camps, hooies, and events of all types. We need more things happening to create noise on the net, to make outsiders envious about all of the good stuff going on here in New Zealand. And that's not the only attraction issue on our plate. As odd as it sounds, we need to attract our own university students into our industry, because the academic system doesn't offer an easy route into the tech industry. They may end up finding jobs abroad. Here in Wellington, if it weren't for Summer of Tech, an, an internship and industry training program, would be losing a lot of our most talented students overseas. But like the rest of the community-driven organisations, Summer of Tech need our help too. They need help running events, teaching boot camps, reviewing CVs and guiding students. Hopefully one day, in the not too distant future, they'll be in all of the cities around New Zealand. But to do so, they need our help. We need to increase the public profile of New Zealand's technical community so that others from all around the world start talking about this community of ours, this country of ours. We need to do this so we can attract people nationally and internationally into our tech community so we can all prosper together. And once we're growing and attracting talent, we have to ensure that they want to stay here in New Zealand, but more importantly, in our industry. And be, to be brutally honest, we suck at retention. Let's start with the easiest problem we have, career growth. We need to ensure everyone in our industry has adequate mentoring so that they know where they're going and have the help they need to get there. There's no point having all of the talent in the world only to have it phase out when a generation retires. But because good mentoring is best served one-on-one, -on -one, it's tricky to scale. But if we can find people willing to sacrifice 30 minutes a fortnight 
That's all it'll take. Half an hour a fortnight over a coffee or tea where you can share ideas and experiences with a growing individual, helping them reach their full potential. Then there's the hard problems. They really are hard, sir. Like, why are there so few many? Why are there so few women in tech? What about New Zealand Maori representation or other Pacific Island ethnicities? Why aren't they adequately being represented in our industry? Then there's contempt culture, pushing people away from the tech scene, enforcing that because you don't code with my language, you're a lesser coder than me. It makes talented people feel unwelcomed purely based off the tools that they use. As an industry, we have a tendency to burn ourselves out, whether it's from working in a startup, grinding through those 70 hour weeks, or being the hero developer in your workplace, the person that everyone looks to in times of need. Everything is stacked against us, and we just work until we collapse. And let's not beat around the bush. On top of all of that, we've got embedded gender and race bias rampant throughout all levels of our industry, making it incredibly hard for anyone who's not a white, cisgender man to get by. If you should notice there's biases in your company, then you need to speak up. Talk to your employer. Ask them, what are they doing to address this problem? Use your power to bring about change from within. You probably have a lot more sway with your boss than you realize. And if you find out that they'd like to become a more diverse employer, but don't know how, then point them to our community. Let us help. Because when they change and become a fully inclusive employer, everyone benefits. All of the problems that I've just mentioned are very, very hard problems. And the change needed can't be solved with money alone. The change needs to come from our community and our society. We need to start these discussions to break down the stigmas around sharing personal struggles and fears. We need to help address the structural mental discrimination, sexism and racism we have in our industry by building support networks, working groups, meetups and online channels where people can have safe, open and frank discussions about these issues. I believe that through discussion, solutions can be found and from there, actions can be taken to address our problems. To retain our people, we have to be aiming for longevity of careers in tech, to be more acceptant of everyone, no matter their background, and to cater for all the shapes and sizes us humans come in. Tech has to be for everyone, for everyone to be in tech. And it all starts with a conversation. And finally, to grow New Zealand to its potential, we need to connect everyone together. We need to connect talent with other talent. We need to connect our communities with other communities. And we need to connect our towns and cities together. Connecting our talent together can happen in any way, shape, or form. Through meetups, community events, hackathons, conferences, online forums. Through these hubs, talented people will meet. And networking is sure to happen. So we can't forcibly create these connections, but we can create the mediums in which these connections can take place. When we're growing our community, we need to look at connecting our technical community with other non-technical ones, like religious groups, iwi, ethnic communities, NGOs, and non-profits. Working with these non-technical communities puts us in a better position to work on bigger picture problems giving us the chance to address issues that plague society at a higher level. And in connecting our towns and cities should also be high on that priority list. Starting a meetup in your local town is a great way to kick this off. By forming local hubs, we can get to know one another better and to allow for distributed communities to live outside of our city centres. Through these distributed hubs, communication will become easier and allow for a greater feeling of interconnectedness it largely just relies on one person leading the charge and forcing about change. One person starting a meetup or regular event. Just one person has the ability to create a new community. 
But therein lies the danger. If that one person becomes burnt out, moves away, or starts a family, then the community can be at risk of dying. We need to build resilient communities where leadership is distributed and easily passed on. <coughs> so when you start up a community hub, look towards creating organizational teams and sharing responsibility, and be sure to think about how you'll pass on the mantle of leadership from the very beginning. And lastly, when you're starting anything with people, ensure you have a code of conduct and ensure you're willing to enforce it. Code of conducts are how you can make everyone feel safe within your community. And by having one in place and knowing how to use it, you can ensure the safety of everyone within. Connecting everyone together isn't something we can address directly. We address this through creating the right environment where connections can grow and flourish, where people can meet other people, share ideas and spread knowledge, where people can make new friends and create strong, lasting bonds. So those are the four main points we need to work on to align our tech community with Sir Paul's vision. In doing so, we should aim to create a country where everyone, young and old, has equal access to learning technology, where everyone has the chance to grow their talents, where entrepreneurs no longer have a shortage of talented people to call on when they're building their tech companies, where immigrants instantly feel welcomed into our community, where they can make new friends and bonds so they'll want to stay, where all of us can feel safe, comfortable, and welcome in this industry of ours. But above all, we should be aiming to include everyone in tech, all communities, all groups, all peoples. And to do this, we need you. We need you to help teach our children. We need you to help mentor others with less experience than your own. We need you to run events. We need you to attend events. We need you to help create community networks. We need you to share your ideas. We need you to help us grow New Zealand. We need you to help get us tech to everyone and make New Zealand reach its full potential. So that's all work together to make New Zealand a place where talent can thrive. And by doing so, make New Zealand prosperous so everyone in our country can benefit. And everyone is different. People help out in different ways. If you're still thinking, I'd like to help, but I don't know where to start, then go to this site, fill out your name and email address, and hit submit. If you can do that, I'll point you in the right direction. I'll send you to someone that needs your help. I'll try my hardest to get you helping us. My goal is to lower the barrier to entry as much as possible so more people can contribute to New Zealand's technical communities. And if just one of you fills out that form, I'll consider this conference talk a success. And that's it. Thank you all for listening. I hope you've all enjoyed the conference. Kakiteano.